So as you see here on the board, we are at uh, chapter 27 of our confession of the sacraments. Man, we are getting closer and closer to the end. There's only six left. It's hard to believe uh, how fast time has flown by. I cannot believe we're already getting close to the end here. Anyway, let's, uh, let's go to God in prayer and ask for his blessing upon the uh, study here. Our Father, Lord God, thank you for this beautiful morning. Thank you for the time that we have together. Father, thank you most of all that um, as we look into this confession, we see what it is that you have us to know. We see your will laid out in doctrinal form. And Lord, we know that doctrine is important for us, not just for pastors, not just for elders, but for all of us. And you have blessed the man who created this document to chisel out um, the doctrines of, the, of your word for us to be able to use, to be able to learn. And uh, Father, we give you all the glory and praise this morning. May uh, your spirit lead us and guide us. In Christ's name, amen. Amen. Okay, so as you see, I wrote out some things. I didn't know what all to really put up here. But you, you see some of the some things up here that we're going to discuss. Um, we'll read we'll read the first two sections together. Section one. Sacraments are holy signs and seals of the covenant of grace, immediately instituted by God to represent Christ and his benefits, and to confirm interest in him as also to put visible difference between those that belong unto the church and the rest of the world, and solemnly to engage them to the service of God in Christ according to his word. Section two, there is, a, there is in every sacrament a spiritual relation or sacramental union between the sign and the thing signified. Whence it comes to pass that the names and effects of the one are attributed to the other. So as we look at this chapter here in our confession, um, the confession, and even in our, AR, in our ARP book of worship, or our standards, um, we see the word sacrament being used. However, we do not see that word used in scriptures. Most of the time, we will see the, uh, the covenantal language, signs and seals, and so forth. So, the sacrament, the word sacrament came to be applied in a broad and vague sense to the Christian baptism and the Lord's Supper. It is, however, affirmed in and among men that the word sacrament is to be, is applied to a religious task or ordinance, excuse me. And we can define sacrament in the following. Our Westminster Larger Catechism, question 162, and Westminster Shorter Catechism 92, define for us that a sacrament is an ordinance immediately instituted by Christ. A sacrament consists always of two elements. One, an outward, sensible, visible sign, and two, an inward, spiritual grace, thereby signified. The sign in every sacrament is sacramentally united to the grace which it signifies. And out of this union, the scriptural usage has arisen from ascribing to the sign whatever is true of that which is the sign or which the sign signifies. The sacraments were designed to represent, seal, and apply the benefits of Christ and the new covenant to believers as Westminster Shorter Catechism question 92 affirms. They were designed to be pledges of our fidelity to Christ, binding us to his service, and at the same time, badges for our professions, for our profession, excuse me, visibly marking the body of professors and distinguishing them from the world. The first section of our chapter here um, demonstrates the intent of the divines to make sure we understand what is meant by sacraments being instituted by Christ. We are no longer concerned about those sacraments of the Old Testament. 
but we will address some. We'll address that somewhat in um, further down into the uh, this chapter, which uh, you know the Old Testament sacraments that we're concerned with would be circumcision and the Passover. We'll, like I said, we'll get with those in another section here. These are the only sacraments for the church today that have been instituted by Christ. A sacrament, again, is a holy ordinance instituted by Christ in his church. This definition that our Westminster standards give us here serves <clears throat> as to ensure that we do not misunderstand the fact that there are only two sacraments. And we know that there are other religious affiliations or organizations, whatever you want to call them, uh, that hold to more sacraments other than the, the two that we know are true. Um, Roman Catholicism, you know, for one, uh, has added what we call, what I call, faith ordinances or uh, sacraments. I think they have a total of uh, seven, as you see here. So, Looking briefly at the elements mentioned above and what their properties uh, of the sacraments consist of, as we said, an outward sensible sign or visible sign, uh, inward spiritual grace. In baptism, the outward visible sign is water and to the application of the water in the name of the triune God to the person being baptized. Therefore, uh, the one inward visible sign is the spiritual cleansing by the immediate power of the Holy Spirit, which is now per, which is now the personal indwelling of the Holy Spirit in the person being baptized. Two, now because of the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, there is union with Christ, and consequently from that union, we see regeneration, justification, sanctification, perseverance therein to the end, and glorification which are all the benefits of the new covenant. In the Lord's Supper, the outward visible signs are the bread and wine, the dedication or consecration of the bread being broken uh, and the wine or the grape juice being distributed or poured out, so to speak, and taken by the congregants or communicant members and eaten and drunk. The inward visible sign is the spiritual grace which is signified one, Christ crucified, his body broken, ripped, and his blood shed for his people to be welcomed and absorbed as the principle of a new life, or the elements to, to be absorbed as the principle of a new life. Two, the benefits are again a demonstration of our union with Christ, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, regeneration, justification, sanctification, perseverance, and glorification. And all these benefits are guaranteed by his sacrificial death. Any questions so far on what we're discussing here? Okay. In the sacraments, there is a spiritual relationship or a sacramental union, uh, as uh, section two states, between the sign and the thing being signified. This union between the sign and the grace that it signifies as the Roman Catholics and Lutherans perceive in regard to the Lord's Supper is a literal union or a literal identity, excuse me. The rationale for this literal identity is taken from when Christ had taken the bread and said, this is my body. So they take that to be a literal thing. <clears throat> we on the other hand, we understand that Christ was not saying literally his body, but in a symbolic sense. Therefore, the sacramental union is between the sign and the thing signified. One, the symbolical and representative. The one that symbolizes and so represents the other. And two, instrumental because by divine appointment, through the right use of the sign, the grace signified is really conveyed. Therefore, the grounds of this sacramental union are the following. One, the innate strength of the sign that symbolizes the grace signified in the washing with water, symbolizing spiritual purification by the Holy Spirit. Two, the divine authority of Christ that the, that the signs justifiably employed 
represent and communicate the grace they signify. Three, the spiritual faith of the believer, the recipient, which is a gift from the Spirit of Christ in whom the recipient is aided in the proper use of the sign. And the recipient is empowered to discern the Lord's body. 1 Corinthians 9.29 As we've noted here concerning the relation between the sign and the signified, <clears throat> we now understand that for us to eat the bread and to drink the cup, we are eating the flesh and drinking the blood of Christ by his efficacious death. That is, we participate in his sacrificial death. When we partake of the Lord's Supper, we're uh, participating in his sacrificial death. And with regard to baptism and with the Holy Spirit is true with baptism in water. We see this explicitly taught in Scripture uh, that this union, and when Ananias told Paul to go wash away his sins in Acts 22, 16, and we also see um, in Scriptures as well, Christ giving himself for the church to sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word of God, Ephesians 5, 26. And then also in Acts 2, 38, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. To Roman Catholics and others who, uh, like the Greek Orthodox, or, East, or excuse me, Eastern Orthodox, have uh, reason the sign is inseparable from the grace signified, and the spiritual effects are due in large to the outward ordinance, the doctrinal ordinance of baptismal regeneration. It must be noted here that Scripture does not assert these spiritual attributes that are assumed, but water baptism as the sign and emblem of baptism by the Holy Spirit. The spiritual attributes which belong solely to baptism by the Holy Spirit, therefore, they accompany the sign, and when the sign is accompanied by that which is signified, therefore, it does not follow that the sign is inseparable from grace. The sacraments were designed to represent Christ in the new covenant. They are demonstration they're demonstrations of truths in which they are representative of and therefore display those truths to the senses of the recipients in corresponding and, and, and corresponding in the way they are presented and the preaching of the word of God. This gives credence to their being outward and sensible signs and signifying inwardly, inwardly and also spiritual grace. They're designed to be seals of the benefits of the new covenant in the sacraments God wisely and with authority promises himself to enable us into the into this grace upon our believing and obeying any questions so far are we okay I just want to make sure I don't want to leave anybody behind or uh, you know sounding confusing or whatever Our partaking of the sacraments is our active assuming or active uh, obligation of that which is implicit in the gospel, and we oblige ourselves to achieve them. <clears throat> Paul, remind, <clears throat> Paul reminds us that the physical circumcision was the seal of the righteousness of faith, Romans 4.11, but then adds in another epistle that baptism Christian, you know, the baptism that we do today is the circumcision of Christ. Colossians 2, verses 11 through 12. Paul states that we are actually buried with Christ in baptism, Romans 6, 4, and we are united to him in his death. Jesus adds that this cup is the new covenant in his blood, Luke 22, verse 20. In other words, this cup represents his blood by which the new covenant is ratified, which in essence means that it is the visible affirmation of the covenant, since it is a vi visible representation of his blood. Paul makes it clear that if a man is to be circumcised, then he is a debtor to fulfilling the entire law, Galatians 5.3. 
As many that have been baptized in Christ have put on Christ, Galatians 3, 20, excuse me, Galatians 3, 27. The sacraments were created to apply in reality, essentially, to communicate to the believer the benefits of the new covenant. As seals, they are to communicate the grace represented to those to whom it belongs. Our confession affirms insistently the administering or the applying in which the English word uh, exhibit its former meaning conveys administration. It does not mean to display, but the former meaning of the word exhibit means administration. So we will see that in the uh, next sections uh, that we will address here, that word is used. But it comes from the Latin word exhibere. Intends, uh, as I was saying, it's uh, intention, it means to administer. Um, the sacraments are holy ordinances instituted by Christ, therefore the visible and sensible signs along with the benefits of the new covenant are represented, sealed, and applied to the believers. <clears throat> a sacrament is in an holy ordinance instituted by Christ in his church to signify, seal, and exhibit, or minister, unto those that are within the covenant of grace, the benefits of his mediation. Uh, as we see in West, Westminster Larger Catechism, question uh, 162. The grace that is exhibited in or by the sacraments done in a rightly manner is not conferred by any power in them. So the sacraments themselves do not have any power in them. The efficacy of baptism is not linked to the time in which it is administered, but the right use of, the holy, of this holy ordinance is not only given, but really exhibited or administered and bestowed by the Holy Spirit. And we will see that in the next chapter of the confession Westminster, you know, the chapter 28, 26 specifically. In our next section, we will also look at or look into this idea that the sacraments having no power in and of themselves, but the proper use of them is in which by divine appointment of the Holy Spirit conveys the grace to whom it belongs. Therefore, this grace bestowing is dependent upon two factors. The sovereign will of the Holy Spirit and, the, and two, the energetic faith of the recipient. <clears throat> the sacraments, being seals of the covenant of grace, at once a balance of God's faithfulness to us and our duty to him in which the sacraments mark us as the divine property of God, excuse me, and causes us to be binding to the performance of our duty, and consequently, which are badges of our profession and making visible differentiation between those in whom belong to the church and to the rest of the world. It is a visibility to the church and separation of the members of the church from the world. Section three. The grace which is exhibited, there's that word, and or by the sacraments rightly used is not conferred by any power in them, as we noted earlier, neither does the efficacy of a sacrament depend upon the piety or intention of him that does administer, or administer, excuse me, but upon the work of the Spirit and the work of institution which contains together with a precept authorizing the use thereof, a promise of benefit to worthy receivers. So as we looked at, it, like I said, in the previous section uh, concerning the sacraments, the conference of this grace, which they denote to the partakers, our confession goes on in this section to safeguard this important truth from mistreatment or misuse by demonstrating upon what this grace communicating efficacy of the sacraments does not and upon what it does depend. One, the grace that is being spoken of here is not within the sacraments themselves. 
and it is not granted by any power in the sacraments. Now, Roman Catholics and the Eastern Orthodox, uh, possibly Russian Orthodox as well, see that great see that this grace signified contained in the sacrament itself as characteristics that are real substances together with the outward sign presented in a real tangible meaning to all partakers whether they believe or not so they give it to everybody whether they believe it or not but we know specifically that the lord's supper and baptism is for who for us for believers right that's it it's not for the world, it's for us. They adhere to the notion that the sacrament gives grace to or upon every recipient who do not resist. And this is a what we call an opus operatum by them, um, by the explicit power of the sacramental action, like the utilization of a branding iron upon a calf when we're branding um, cattle. Nonetheless, our confession rightly denounces this fallacy. The efficacy of the sacrament does not depend upon any part of the sacrament, nor upon the whole altogether, but solely upon the sovereign power of the Holy Spirit, who is always present, and the sacraments are the means in which he uses the medium. The efficacy does not depend upon the piety or the intention of the one administering it, or administering the sacraments. Roman Catholics affirm that the administration of the sacraments do not depend upon piety of the one administering the sacraments. However, they argue that it does depend upon, A, the fact, the fact the one who administers must be canonically or canonically authorized, B, the fact that the one administering exercises at the precise moment of the administration the undisclosed purpose of what the church intends in the definition of the sacrament. Therefore, the priest may do all that he is required and the recipient likewise. And if the parties, or if the, excuse me, not the parties, but if the priest fails to give the secret intent of conferring grace in the sacrament right there, the recipient or partaker walks away in a deprived, in, uh, in deprived of the grace that he or she is supposed to have received, which the priest disobediently declared <clears throat> or to have delivered. He was supposed to give that intention. If he does not give that intention, then that person who is receiving the sacrament walks away without the grace and he serves a huge dishonor to that person. <clears throat> Christ therefore seals his covenant by them in their use devotes grace of the covenant to every soul which he belongs. Now the, uh, the efficacy of the sacrament is in the sovereign and omnipresent personal agency of the Holy Spirit who utilizes the sacraments the Spirit's instruments and medium of operation the Holy Spirit is the executive of God and in whom takes the things concerning Christ and displays them to us through the Holy Spirit even the humanity of Christ is really omnipresent and all the benefits are protected by his atoning word are made evident and applied Section four. There be only two sacraments ordained by Christ, our Lord, and the gospel. That is to say, baptism and the supper of the Lord, neither of which may be dispensed by any but a minister of the word lawfully ordained. Here in this section, it clearly delineates who is the one to administer the sacrament. Yes, sir. Definition for lawfully ordained definition for lawfully ordained those well those men who have been called to minister and who have been ordained by the session 
by the laying on of the Baptist ministers and the Methodist ministers and the Episcopalians, etc. Is that true of the word coordination? I'm asking. I bet it's not. I don't think it is. Because, I, I mean, you know, the, what do they go on? They go on by the fact of if a man's called, okay, well, we can. We can test you a little bit, and then there you go. That's about the uh, extent of their ordination. But I see. I don't see any of that in scripture. Right. I don't see the session or a governing body has to ordain. What I see in scripture is that right. God calls to me. Right. Now, I don't. I don't know. I, I yeah. don't, that's a good that's, question. That's a question that's always. I've heard all the logic and the arguments, but I. I'm just. I don't understand it. I understand. And that, that's a good question. It, it, it is we a can, gift. It's a sign of the seal from God. Right. That I'm a Christian. Yeah. Now, oh, just I know. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, on the one hand, uh, I want to affirm that, you know, I'm a, uh, as they say, a Jerry Divina Presbyterian. Uh, I do believe that, that Presbyterianism is taught in the New Testament and therefore is binding on the church having said that because a church has a deficient ecclesiology and a deficient understanding of church government yeah. doesn't make it not a true church right and so you could have a baptist church or an Anglican church and so for example i would say that prelacy is a sin right prelacy is a violation of what we're set forth in the scriptures mm -hmm. uh, which again i do believe is presbyterian but uh that doesn't mean that i couldn't go to uh, an Anglican church and participate in the sacrament, or a Baptist church and participate in the sacrament. Uh, I think that it is permissible, and it's it's still lawful, and they are lawfully ordained uh, in this broad sense. Um, so there's a there's a distinction between having a pure form of church government and having any church government at all. Right. Um, so I see what you're saying. Yes. You know, it, I mean, you know, we're seeing First Timothy four, uh, verse fourteen. I mean, from the New American Standard, if you guys want to follow along, if not, that's fine. I'll read it aloud. Uh, it says in verse 14 of 1 Timothy 4, Do not neglect the spiritual gift within you, which was bestowed on you through prophetic utterances, or prophetic utterance, with the laying on of hands by the presbytery. So, you know, we see presbytery, you know, what is presbytery? You know, which is uh, the coming together of elders, laying on hands for that person who's been called. And what I meant by, by saying, like for instance, how the Baptists do it, I don't see that as being a, a true sense of ordination. I have a friend, I have a friend who is a Baptist minister, and in the time of what Michael was saying, basically the process that he went through was the local Baptist churches within that area sat down in front of him, basically, you know, in kind of a semicircle, put him right there in the middle, and they were just asking questions, left and right. And this problem went on for about an hour. And that's it. He was, you know, that's the extent of their ordination process. You know, and I guess for me, I'm also, it's hard for me to fathom another way. You know what I'm saying? Because I've been going through the ARPs, method and where the man is truly grilled not just and taught and taught and not just simply asking questions whatever may be on your mind but it's asking questions from every aspect of theology there's not a corner uh, unturned not a stone uh, that's not been overturned everything and I agree with that process it's yeah. just that yeah. in the scriptures I don't I don't pick up either sure. word. The definition of lawfully ordained is being only Presbyterians that follow this form of government. Right. I do think this form of government is correct. Right. I see what you're saying. And, you know, and, and I apologize. I don't have a full, full answer. Now, and I don't need it. And I've been playing yeah. over that and thinking about it. Yeah. Early, early in my Christian walk, uh, I was a member of a Quaker church. Mm -hmm. And they didn't believe in the sacrament. They wouldn't, they disavow that it's a gift of God and a sign of the Right. Uh, as I read the scriptures, me and a friend, we had a cell group in our homes and we would 
take turn for me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But at one point in time in that process, we had communion in the homes. Mm -hmm. And as I grew in the scriptures and understood the confessions, I realized that was a sin. That was wrong. Right. I was not ordained. But I still had that question right. unanswered. Uh, define lawfully ordained. And I think I've got it myself. Yeah. And and I think it's, you know, be it Episcopalian or Baptist, if they love truly love the Lord Jesus Christ and God has called them and right. and they are recognized by their peers, then it's not a sin for them to have communion for their people. Right. And, you know, and, and if I'm wrong, I'm going to be correct. Right. I mean, absolutely. <coughs> and uh, even for myself as well, uh, you know, I attended supposedly a non-denominational church, but they were of uh, the Plymouth Brethren. Now they, they broke bread every Sunday, yeah. every Sunday. It was a literal loaf of bread on that plate and they would break it in four ways. Mm -hmm. And one of the elders did that. Um, but as far as recognizing a man uh, to come and preach, all you had to do is, uh, you know, just like what Phil was saying, just demonstrate that you, you know, you have expressed interest in, in the Word of God, and, and other people, you know, witness that. There you go. Well, you know, I know no, I was wrong. Process. I know I was wrong to do yeah. what I did, uh, but it's just, I just believe it in that. But yeah, I, I'm trying to understand what the sure. definition of yeah, I, I, lawfully yeah. ordained, lawfully <laughs> in the eyes of Scripture. Maybe we, that's a question we can ask Eric. Maybe he knows. Uh, maybe it's according to the standards. Maybe it's, uh, I don't know. I, I, I'm at a loss with that. I apologize. That's okay. So here in section four, you know, as we have you know, been discussing. Um, now I do accept four. I don't, I don't have that to the <laughs> No, I, I know. No, I know you do. Yeah, I know. I feel bad for not being able to you know, fully answer it. I'm like, man, I'm like, I don't even think I'm full of that. But anyway. Richard, I got a question. Yes, sir. Uh, maybe Phil asked this and I didn't catch it. The frequency in which we observe the Lord's Supper, uh, we as Presbyterians, is it, we do it every Sunday. Is that every ARP church? Is that, uh, mm -hmm. no. all right, so. Preference. It, it, yeah. Some ARP churches do. Uh, Dr. David Smith can give you a good explanation of yeah. why he does. The reason we began doing it is because we wanted to come before the Lord and express that sign and seal yes. every Sunday to God, our love and our devotion to Him. So, and I think that's a good reason. And, and it is. And I, th I think it's, uh, you know, to tie it in a little bit more, you know, you see the pattern in the book of Acts. Every time they come together, what do they do? They broke bread. And uh, so... Well, that's a figure of speech, though, isn't it? Not necessarily. Most of, yeah, most of the time they come together, uh, mm -hmm. like, they did it at the beginning of the week, and any time they had uh, like a, a fellowship, or whatever, breaking of bread, I, that's, I understood that to be communion. I, yes, was, I was surprised to read about some Puritan groups, and maybe Michael could uh, identify yeah. which, but they made the case for an annual Lord's Supper based on the Passover. And even beyond that, there were tokens given out upon examination mm -hmm. of their life. And this was a major event coinciding with Passover. Mm -hmm. And Bradley, they would use that breaking of bread as meeting to eat. You know, they would okay. explain it that way. Yeah. And I don't. I think that we certainly need latitude there. But the argument against that would be that's infrequent. Right. It's not as often as you do this. It seems. Go ahead, Mike. So uh, just to add to that, that's right. There are still Presbyterian churches that uh, practice uh, uh, communion seasons, mm -hmm. and oddly, there's an irony in these churches. And I have good, again, good friends in these churches um, will sometimes be opposed to extra biblical feast days mm -hmm. and an extra biblical calendar. Right. But that's precisely what communion seasons are. <laughs> it, it's, it's, it becomes a, effectively a, an extra biblical calendar. Right. Because, yes, right. Calendar. Um, so, on the other hand, you have in the director of public worship, uh, even the Westminster Assembly, yeah. expresses they don't specify how frequently. Right. But they do say frequently, right? So uh, it's it, it, I think it's healthy to have frequently for the simple reason that it's requiring us to examine ourselves before we come to the table, and so you only have in our case the space of one week to the next mm. to examine yourself 
and it doesn't leave you going months on end without saying, well, I can push this off till. Right, and, and, and that's where I was gonna go with that. Um, in my thoughts, I, I believe that doing it weekly uh, is, is, a, is a very good thing. Uh, just as what Michael was saying, anytime you start stretching it out, you know, like you say, you know, you tend to forget, you know, we are forgetful, we are fallen, we, you know, we do commit sin. And so therefore, it does good for us to come back every week before we take of that communion. Hey, you know, I need to get myself right with God in order to worship him, you know, to be in a right place. And, you know, as communion, uh, it reminds us of the sacrificial death of Christ. It also points to a futuristic meeting or a dinner with him or when we can, or a feast with him when we can all sit down without any hindrances, without sin, and we can do that. But it also, communion is a good, help, helpful reminder, hey, you know, am I in the right place? Is there things that I need to do to make, my, to make right? Do I need to go apologize to this brother over here? Do I need to confess my sin that I may have overlooked or forgotten? That, you know, so to me, it's, I think it's right. For us to do it every week, you do have some ARP churches, uh, Covenant Presbyterian up in uh, Miller's Creek. They do it once a month, first Sunday of every month. I, I would say one of the more important things about communion is you listen to Eric or any pastor mm -hmm. when they pitch the table. Yeah. And listen to the words. You're you're yes. coming before God, and you're communing with His Holy <laughs> Spirit, and you're presenting your life <laughs> to Him right. as you partake of the supper. Absolutely. And that, that's serious. It's not casual. And that seriousness every week does a lot for me. Well, right. And, and, and it's covenantal. Yeah. It's covenantal. Wow. Uh, on that topic of fencing the table, I was going to ask uh, for your thoughts on if you have the, as you expressed earlier, the unbeliever does not participate in the grace presented in the sacrament. But does that mean that the unbeliever who comes to the table or who's baptized is merely participating in the bare sign or is something more going on there? So basically if an unbeliever partakes, is he just participating in the sign? I mean, you know, how could the Holy Spirit uh, efficaciously apply the grace? the inward grace, you know, to somebody who's not his. Um, so, yeah, I think it would be just a mere partaking of the sign. Um, you know, we, you know, as we noted before, even in the visible church, you know, we have lots of people, I say lots, we have people that are unsaved, that are a part of the church. But yet, every time communion comes around, they partake of it. In their mind, they believe that they are. But they, you know, the, the relationship but the end is not there. So, you know, I think it's just the participation of the sign. The only reason I ask um, is that, that becomes a, a difficult issue when you bring up the fencing of the table and the associated curse for those who violate it. Yeah. And so while it's true that the unbeliever clearly is not participating in the grace that is signified and mm -hmm. sealed here, mm -hmm. because that's applied by the Spirit, and of course received by faith. Right. Yet, it's not as though nothing is happening, because if nothing were happening, then there would be no associated curse. Right. So they really are partaking of sacrament, but okay. it's, the, the issue is not with the sacrament. The sacrament is is connected to the promises of God and the right. grace offered there. The problem is not there. The problem is with the person over here who's not receiving by faith. Right. And when they come and violate it, it's not merely that you're just putting bread in your mouth and drinking wine, because if that were all that was going on, no big deal. No, there's a grace promise back of that that you're violating. Right. That's the that's the what I was going to ask. Yeah. Yeah. So, any more questions? Okay. All right. So here um, in section four, uh, we see uh, we understand that there are, like I say, we noted before, there are only two sacraments: baptism and the Lord's Supper. Now, the Roman Catholics settle on the number 
of sacraments through their councils. And finally, I think at the Council of Trent, they settled on uh, the number of uh, seven. Baptism, the Lord's Supper, penance, extreme unction, confirmation, and marriage. So confirmation, penance, and extreme unction are not divine institutions. The institution of marriage was given by God, not specifically by Christ, and orders were instituted by Christ, but neither of these are ordinances. Uh, excuse me, neither of these ordinances consist of an outward visible sign, which signifies the inward and the spiritual grace, nor B, does either of them represent, seal, or confer Christ and the benefits of the new covenant. Our confession also asserts uh, that the only one that is allowed to administer the sacraments is an ordained minister. This assertion gives no credence to, as what the Roman Catholics believe, uh, to the interest of the transmission by mere ordination and succession from the apostles to the priests. However, we understand that the great and wonderful head of our, of our church, the true church, is Christ and the sacraments being the badges of church membership, true church membership, the instruments of discipline and the seals of the covenant with his living members can be properly administered only by the legal officers of the church, those who are commissioned that are ambassadors for Christ. <clears throat> First Corinthians 4, verse 1, and 2 Corinthians 5, verse 20. And finally, uh, section 5. The sacraments, the sacraments of the Old Testament in regard to the spiritual things thereby signified and exhibited were for the substance the same with those of the new. In chapter 7, way back in sections 5 and 6, address the former and new dis dispensations which merely are two different modes in which the, the one immutable covenant of grace was administered and blessings bestowed. Therefore, the seals of the covenant are the same for both dispensations. The only difference is that one, they were prospective and typical then, and that they are commemorative <coughs> now. In the former dispensation, the sacraments signified a grace to be revealed then, and two, they signified a grace that is already revealed now. Two, number two, then they were a more gross form and carnal and more spiritual now. Baptism has replaced circumcision as the rite of initiation. They both signify spiritual re regeneration. Deuteronomy 10, 16, and 30, verse 6. Circumcision was a Jewish baptism. Baptism now for us is the Christian circumcision. Galatians 3, 27 and 29, and Colossians 2, verses 10 through 12. Therefore, the Lord's Supper derived out from the Passover. He took the old bread and the old cup and gave them a new consecration and a new meaning. Matthew 26, verses 26 through 29. Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. 1 Corinthians 5, 7. Any questions? <laughs> I do admit, when studying this section, it was difficult for me in a lot of ways. Uh, you know, getting into that whole thing about sign and signified and uh, the seals and all that. I understand it to a, a uh, to a point, but I'm still working through this, and I appreciate y'all's patience with me. Uh, oftentimes, I struggle with uh, wanting to throw my opinion upon those things, and, uh, and I apologize for that that aspect. Uh, yes, sir. I was going to say, if it's any consolation, I was really struck and almost surprised after reading Calvin's section on communion. Yeah. And at the very end, he says, this is indeed a profound mystery. I'm paraphrasing. Yeah. He says, it's something that I experienced more than I can explain. Right. Well, and, and I thought that was almost Calvin the charismatic moment, where it was like he was experiencing yeah. communion, but he couldn't fully explain it. Well, that makes me feel better. <laughs> 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 But anyway, thank you, John. Any questions? <laughs> and, and we'll
what's, and so forth. But anyway, let's go to God in prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord God, we thank you and we praise you for your goodness. Lord, we look at this, um, the, the, the sacraments that you've given us. And Lord, we know that uh, you intend for us to be a covenantal relationship with you, to be part of your family. And through baptism and the Lord's Supper, to give us badges to make us recognizable to you and to separate us from the world. Father, as we go from here today and we go into uh, worshiping you, uh, we pray, Lord, that your hand will be upon the pastor, uh, upon those who will be leading the service. And Lord, may your word go forth and do that which you have commanded it to do. We uh, ask you, Lord, uh, for your blessing to be upon the rest of, of the day. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Thank you.